I would like to bring up uh, Mr. Elliot Lebeau, who's a subject matter expert and um, has been an emotional health and wellness advisor for the American Diabetes Association, because he also got involved with the Step Out Movement to Stop Diabetes and really has played a leadership role in leading many workshops. And um, he as well has um, done a lot of outreach and is online in the social media community spreading the message about diabetes awareness and ensuring that people get accurate information. He is one of only a handful of individuals in, uh, the, in the U.S. that does a lot of important health education and coaching to fellow individuals who live with diabetes. And so he'll be sharing a little bit more on the relationship with the men's health and wellness and uh, positive sexual health and offering some ideas and strategies on how to do that, both in living with diabetes and also in passing along as a caregiver for someone that you care about. So I'd like to introduce Mr. Elliot Lebeau to come up. That's how this function, out of control blood sugars, impact our mental and physical reality. One of the biggest impacts of erectile dysfunction in men is not necessarily a physical. A lot of times it's an emotional or psychological piece. When blood sugar is high or conversely too low, a diabetic will have distortions both mentally and physically. When blood sugar's level returns to normal and reality kicks us right between the eyes, what then? Every situation is different. There are ways to prevent these distortions from happening or managing them so less or no personal damage occurs. A few years back, John was dating a beautiful woman. John would think about her daily. When John was with her, John was filled with an excitement and delight. But something happened at the end of their sixth date. John always considered himself a virile man who could sustain an erection for hours on end. So erectile dysfunction was further thing from his mind. Well, you probably know what happens next, but let me move along and not belabor this point. This was an embarrassing and scary moment for John when he didn't have an erection. Luckily, she was really cool about it. The next day, they went out to dinner and shared a great chocolate lava cake. John adjusted his insulin and thought things were going great, but in the back of his mind, he was still thinking about what had happened the night before and was very worried. They got back to his place, set the mood, candles, jazz, and dimmed the lights. Everything was perfect except for John. He was excited and eager, but did not rise to the occasion. What's wrong with me? John thought to himself, and then a little voice in the back of his head answered. John went to go check his blood glucose levels. Wow, he was 390 milligrams over deciliters. John couldn't believe it. John calculated everything perfectly, but somewhere John missed it. And here's what John missed. John missed the fact that they finished dinner an hour ago. It was hard for insulin to burn off complex sugars like a chocolate lava cake, so his blood sugars went higher than normal after dinner. Next, John probably underestimated the amount of carbohydrates in the meal itself. Lastly, John was so stressed about the previous night that his body was releasing extra cortisol. Cortisol is a hormone released by stress and cause our blood sugars to create imbalances in hyperglycemia. So John went around for several days worried that he was going to have to take Viagra to rise to the occasion. In reality, John just needed to test his blood sugars and wait. The next time they met, they watched a movie while waiting and enjoyed their time together. A few hours later, after making sure his blood sugars had stabilized at 120, they tried again and no erectile dysfunction for this virile man. They did it right. In reality, symptoms of diabetes can mimic other physiological and psychological illnesses. Be careful, double check that your patients aren't experiencing a diabetes related problem. It gets very complicated for a diabetic in this world. There's a lot of different 
illness side effects that come with it. You feel sick on a day to day. I myself has been been a diabetic for 34 years. Um, I got diabetes when I was six years old, type one diabetic. One thing is that if a person doesn't keep track of their blood sugar levels, they won't understand why they're not feeling well. One of the problems with consistent high blood sugars is that a depression sets in. Most people look at diabetes and depression as diabetics are more depressed, but you don't really know if it's a depression or it's the side effects of having high blood sugar levels. Those high blood sugar levels can mimic a depression, giving a person blunt affect, a lack of energy and desire. Some people can't get out of bed in the morning because their blood sugars are consistently high. I've seen in my practice people have actually used cocaine so they could get up out every morning to get past their blood sugar levels. When those high blood sugars are there, there's a very good chance that erectile dysfunction will be right there with it. As anyone who cooks know, if you add sugar to something, it thickens up. And essentially, one of the basic facts that happens is the more sugar that's in the blood, the harder it is to pump through the blood system. There's less oxygen to the brain, and what is getting to the brain is drowned in sugar and creates a huge imbalance, creating a cognitive, say, a cognitive pool of jello. One example I use uh, um, every now and then is if um, Phelps was in a pool of jello and everybody else was in a regular pool, how well would he have done? Would he have won a single gold medal? One of the main pieces that comes with this is that it's important to recognize that when someone's with you and they're in front of you and they're telling you that they're having all these problems, what are their blood sugars right there and then? 90% of the times when a client comes in, I'll have them check their blood sugar levels. So I can see what I have to work with in front of me. Because if I give them all this information verbally and they walk out the door, their retention is gone. They're not going to remember it. Their ability to, to reach in and tell me what's wrong with them is also hindered because the recall is distorted. With all these things that are going on, with persons just in front of us, just trying to say, hey, I'm having problems in this area, when we bring it back to erectile dysfunction, the piece that is really important is that when this does happen to a diabetic or anybody who has erectile dysfunction, it's best to talk about it in the moment. So many, so many people keep it to themselves. They feel bad, they start apologizing excessively. Oh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. The more sympathetic and the more she's there for you to support you, and the more she says, um, how may I support you? What can I do for you? How can I help you? The more a man will feel more secure in that it's not the end of the world. Working as a team with, you, with your significant other is very important with erectile dysfunction because you don't know what's necessarily going on. Erectile dysfunction can come from the diabetes or it can come from you had a bad day at work and you're obsessing about what's happened at work. One of the biggest things about sexuality and intimacy is that we have to be there in the moment. If we're not there in the moment and our mind's somewhere else, then the other parts of our body aren't going to react. Because as a good doctor had said, that our mind is our biggest sexual organ. That's where everything comes from. That's where our desire and our urges come from. And that's where the depression, anxiety, and other psychiatric illnesses will hinder a person's ability. A lot of people go right to their doctor and get put right on Viagra. I don't think that's necessarily always the best move because we need to rule out are their blood sugars taking into account because those blood sugars may be the answer. You get someone, their diabetes in control, 
you might find that a lot of the symptomatology and a lot of the illnesses they have start reducing and disappear altogether. In the story, when John was upset, the first time he didn't do anything about it. He didn't check his blood sugar. But what's important is, would have been very important, not only in the moments that, oh, I think there's something wrong, I apologize, wait, I gotta go check my blood sugar, let me go see if that's impacting me. A lot of people don't do that in the moment. And everything is very important in the moment. Otherwise, both people, both parts, partners go off in feeling guilty or sad or upset in one way or another. The more we reduce those negative feelings on the way out, the healthier the relationship's going to become. Anything that isn't said in the moment when a person feels it becomes that white elephant in the room. It's there, it haunts the relationship, little things happen and it sets people off. Even though it has nothing to do with what's in the moment, but something that's keep them, keeping them down or agitated by little things. When in actuality it's a bigger issue like erectile dysfunction. The normal blood sugar levels for a diabetic would be between 80 and 120, 140 are good, are good ranges. Some doctors push it all the way down to 70 and want you to be between 70 and 120. I always encourage my clients to not so close to that line that they're going to go into a hypoglycemic reaction. Because there's not much difference in long term from being at 120 or 140 consistently. It's when you start getting up into those higher levels of 200, 300 that you're going to see the long term effects and you're going to see these complications occur. It's very important that, that when you're working with a diabetic that you make sure one of the things they do is check their blood sugars often. If they know that their blood sugar is high, then they can say, oh, wait a second, let me, stop, let me stop this. Before we go any further, how about we just cuddle for a while instead of um, you know, going right to foreplay. And that'll allow some adjustment time and time for, per for the couple to also get intimacy. A lot of times people jump too quickly and they don't get the intimate moment men have been taught that that is like one of the most primary important things is our sexual prowess. The problem with that thinking is that rising to the occasion can be simply a physical issue and you have no control over that. So some people who have the real physical issues going on, they can't control that. They have no responsibility for that. If their blood sugars are high, diabetes is such a hard disease that our patients need to give themselves a break. A couple high blood sugars isn't going to make a difference overall. A couple low blood sugars, a couple reactions isn't going to change the world. It's when they're totally disregarding their diabetes and their blood sugars remain high. Pretty sure we may be coming on time. I want to ask if we have any questions. I want to say, how do we reach out to and the others and make them understand, you know, make, make them understand what's really going on there and what they need to do. Well, and that's a really good point you're making. It, it, it is really hard to get that message out there. And, you know, one of the wonderful things about the Internet is that everything is in real time now. So one of the things I've done is I've created a platform for my um, for my practice, but it's more but it's become and it's growing into more of a place of information, a resource information for where people can get emotional support, emotional help, and and information about emotions and how their di how they they react to their diabetes. Reaching out is the biggest thing because. My platform is designed to reach out to those in the community to help them because there's nothing worse than feeling alone in having this disease. And support is the most important part. And the best way is, is when you see someone who has diabetes and they're having a bad day, you should just be there and say, how may I best support you? You know, it's not, there's going to be no quick cure to this. 
the best we can do is what we have in the moment and hope that the people that we pass our messages on to will pass it on to other people so that the message continues to grow and, and get out there. Yeah, and also I think that while, while people are, are learning or need to learn how to work with their mates, we're also you know, preventing um, dysfunctional home situations from occurring. Because otherwise, then you start talking about people looking for help on the outside from others because my mate is not understanding, they don't want to help me, everything is a downer or whatever, so I need to find somebody, maybe then they will go to the, to, to the internet and look for people who are caring and sharing and understanding and, and look for help on the other side. And that's really not, not what you want to do, but because people get a little, uh, you know, so they have a one-track mind or they're inhibited, you know, yeah. you start to deal with those kind of issues. Well, and if you're not used to getting emotional support and help, you're kind of tracked into nowhere to go. And so they can hopefully go to the supportive side, or then sometimes people go online and go to a side that's not conducive to continuing the healthy relationship. Think, thinking things are going to be better on the other side, but yet they haven't changed. So things aren't going to get better till they start changing. And that communication with a couple, you're right, it causes a lot of, um, if there's a lack of communication, it creates a lot of problems in a relationship, with diabetes especially. And one thing I find in families is that it always becomes about the diabetes, always talking about the diabetes. I work for also, aside from my private practice and all the work I do with ADA, I also work for a hospital in um, Long Island and I get people who have a variety of different issues. When I have a diabetic come across my desk, most of them are opening to talking about it, but they came through the door for another reason. And so I had one person come through the door for addiction and I was talking to him and he's like, and he, and he became very reactive and he was kind of just like, you know, I thought I was here for my addiction problem. Why aren't we talking about my addiction problem? And he had said that two sessions, and the more I got in, the more I talked to him and told him what's underlying, why he's having the issues he's having, how his diabetes is hindering his emotional and self. He said to me on the third, on the third visit, he said, you know, I'm sorry for being so reactive about the diabetes, just always people, people are always telling me what to do and, and I'm and talking about my diabetes, I'm just so sick of it. And he said, then said, but no one's ever talked to me about in this manner. No one's ever communicated with me. No one's ever opened the dialogue or communication into how I'm feeling about my diabetes. It's always been telling me what to do and how to do it. Instead of spending a few, spending um, a couple minutes sitting down with me and asking me how I feel. In that exchange, I think is a great example of the relationship piece and the lack of relationship that happens in a lot of relationships. And with diabetes, because so many people are focused on, I, I want to help you, they're forgetting to look at that they're there to help the person, not them get under perfect control. Any other questions?